Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for the first edition of our live stream behind the system. My name is Mike. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders at HEMA, uh, the company behind Figma Tokens. Uh, we will attempt to host one of these live streams every month uh, where teams using Figma Tokens give us a practical insight in how they have solved specific problems in their design system using design tokens. Today, we are presenting uh, building an automated multi-brand token workflow presented by Chris Kerr and Nicole Duncan. But before we get there, a little housekeeping. And for that, I'm going to give the microphone over to Robert on our team. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert, uh, based in the Netherlands and recently started uh, with the Figma Tokens team. Um, you can see me as the man between the users and the team. Uh, so if there's any feedback or questions you have, feel free to reach out to me. And now over to some housekeeping. Uh, the session of today is recorded. And after our live stream, it will be available on our website, figmatokens.com. Uh, on the bottom right, uh, you can find the chat. Uh, please use the chat to everyone so everybody can see what you are saying. Next to that, we have a questions button. If you have questions for Nicole or Chris, please post them over there. Uh, before you post the question, please check if the question is already there and otherwise upvote that question so we can keep track of the uh, questions. You can use the hashtag behind the system to share about the event. And uh, this is supposed to be a safe and friendly space, so please be kind, everyone, and respectful. Uh, more information on this can be found on figmatokens.com slash code of conduct. Um, Keep an eye out on our channels. Uh, as Mike uh, already mentioned, we are planning to do a live stream every month. Uh, so keep an eye on those channels uh, uh, to see for the upcoming events. Also, if you have any ideas or suggestions to improve our live streams, please contact us via support at figmatokens.com. And now I want to pass the mic to Chris and Nicole uh, so we can dive straight into uh, the talk. Thanks very much, Robert. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Hi, my name's, uh, my name's Chris. Uh, real pleasure to be with you uh, here today. Um, we're going to, as Mike mentioned, talk to you a little bit about how we're building out uh, an automated multi-brand token workflow. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, but hopefully all will become uh, more clear, uh, we hope, as we go. So as I say, my name's Chris Kerr. I am the Principal Product Designer at Performio. And I'm Nicole Duncan. I am a software engineer at Performio and the dev lead on our design system. Uh, so today, uh, as a way of a bit of an agenda for the session, um, we're going to start with a little bit of uh, context around our design system, uh, how we got here, and kind of where we're at, some of the challenges we faced along the way, um, a little bit of an overview. Then we're going to dive right into uh, the Figma files themselves. Uh, so this whole uh, series is about being kind of uh, behind the system, so we're uh, we're warts and all in the actual file itself, and we'll show you how we've structured our design tokens, how we're trying to tackle multi-brand theming, uh, how we're tokenizing our icons. Uh, some of you may have read an article that was written about that, uh, uh, and then we're going to be looking at how we uh, implement our tokens actually in components in Figma using Figma tokens and non-local styles. Uh, and then we will go uh, through automate, how we actually automate our token delivery workflow, which will also include a, a dive into some of the uh, code side of things with Nicole. Uh, so. Sweet. So, All right. Yes, over to you, Nicole. Cool. Yep. Yeah, just want to kick us off by um, first talking about the origins of our design system. So Performio is a large and complex app with many interfaces. So naturally, we face the challenge of developing a consistent user interface. This is why Performio introduced a design system, which we've called Electric. To speed up the development of Electric, we decided to use a design system as our base. After weighing up a few different design systems, we decided to use Chakra UI, as it's well-built and easy to implement. If you would like to learn more on how we decided on a design system, we do have a blog post on our Performio product and engineering blog, which is just on our Performio website. So we use a few tools to build our design system. We've used Storybook to help build and document our components and tokens. And we use Chromatic to complete regression testing where we can validate any changes made to Electric since the last build. 
of course, we've got our Figma component library that we use as a source of truth for all of our designs. When we first started Electric, we did have uh, very simple base tokens in our theme file. Uh, for example, a color token would be danger 100 or danger 200, which was a good start. However, we quickly ran into issues using these base tokens alone, which Chris will explain further. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so this is where we kind of started our journey. And over the last six months, we've been working on how to tackle some of the challenges that we faced. So uh, as we started building out the design system, it became apparent that if we were going to use a token-based system, we needed to find a way to support our customers who uh, use um, uh, instances of our product which have a certain level of branding on them. So today, that really just involves some basic brand colors, um, but later down the track, we're envisaging uh, a greater degree of white labeling. Um, the simple base tokens that Nicole described uh, uh, also created some challenges um, for the design team as well as the developers. Um, most notably, it's not very clear how to apply those tokens in the context of the components. And so what we'd end up with is quite a lot of inconsistencies between similar concepts. So different border colors on, um, on, on buttons and so forth. So uh, it was leading to a few inconsistencies in there because the tokens themselves weren't very directive in terms of how to use them. Uh, the other aspect uh, was uh, a bit of a reality check that particularly as you build out a design system, uh, there is a lot of change that goes on throughout the course of that process, uh, particularly in the early days. And one of the things that changes an awful lot are your tokens and their values as you build those out and as you understand how to marry up the token structure you need to the component usage you envisage. Uh, if you have just a manual workflow for that, so we're just you know defining a token value somewhere in Figma, and then we're trying to hand that off uh, in a manual way to the development team. That's a very uh, manual way, as I say, uh, but it's very high effort in terms of a workflow. And it takes a lot of time, and causes a lot of frustration. So we really wanted to address from the start, when we look at this, how can we work really, really efficiency, uh, efficiently? We're, we're a small team and we want to make sure we're spending our time focused on solving the right problems. So these are some of the challenges that we faced coming into it. Uh, and so we took a next step. Uh, we were very, very fortunate, I think, to be starting this process really as uh, Figma tokens uh, became so uh, famous, I think. Um, and so we adopted it. Uh, I, I um, yeah, Figma tokens has played a crucial role in our ability to actually roll out our design system uh, as we see it, uh, as we will see it. Uh, we adopted a semantic token approach. So the base tokens needed to be complemented by something which gave the designers and developers a much clearer understanding of how to apply these tokens uh, within the, uh, I guess, the opinions and the decisions that we're taking within the design system. Uh, that Those token namings, they also needed to be standardized somewhat and very clear roles uh, and structures for how we name tokens, um, which uh, leads to obviously a much more consistent design system, but also a much easier rollout of the design system itself. Uh, as I mentioned, we've started working on our automated workflow. Um, so this is about getting the tokens as they're declared in Figma right the way through to the code. And as I say, Nicole's going to talk us through a lot of that later. Uh, and uh, also using the uh, some custom style dictionary transforms and GitHub actions to support that automation, uh, which has also been a, a crucial and fairly recent development for us. So. Uh, before we dive into the files, the Figma setup we have is pretty atypical. Uh, it's what you'd expect to see in a lot of design system teams. Uh, we have a theme library at the center that holds uh, all of our styles. Uh, this one happens to also hold our icons. Uh, and this one will also support uh, all of the different brand themes in a single file. We then have a separate library for our component library. That's handling our little base objects, be it your buttons, your, uh, your, your input fields, your toggles, and so forth. Uh, we also have a pattern library. So this is where we build out more opinionated uses of those components. Uh, we won't dive into that too much today, but we do separate that out uh, for ease of discovery uh, and also for performance. Those components can get quite large. 
Uh, and then separately from all that, we have prototypes that the design team build out uh, along with all the specifications for uh, product features uh, and they consume all of these uh, items. So uh, pretty, pretty atypical setup. Um, the real key here is the separated out theme library with the styles. Um, as many of you will know, the uh, recent launch of non-local styles and Figma tokens has been a game changer here as well because we're allowing us to keep our styles in that library uh, and then use Figma tokens to apply those styles inside components, patterns, prototypes as we see fit whilst maintaining a centralized uh, place for those styles. All right, let's dive in. Okay, here we are in lovely Figma. Um, so uh, this is our theme file. Uh, I guess there's a way of a bit of orientation. We have our styles down sides as usual. Here you can see I have uh, three themes in here. I will explore those later with you. Uh, we also have uh, documentation on uh, our colors, our typography, space and size concepts, shadows, borders, width and radius, uh, and our icons, which we will come back to. Okay, so let's start with color because color is probably the hardest thing to work through from a token perspective. Uh, it's the one that requires uh, a lot of abstraction and a lot of thinking ahead um, and can be really quite challenging to do. This is my second design system and the first design system I put together, uh, we handled color probably in a, a less effective way than we're doing here. So um, I'll walk you through the differences between those two approaches as we go. So let's start with a little bit of an overview then. So a theme for us in Figma, sorry, excuse me. Let me get this guy to zoom in a bit. Um, essentially, we just keep it to three levels, um, three layers. Uh, we'd like to keep that layering short I think if you over abstract with too many layers in uh, your, with your semantic tokens, you can get into a, a, real, uh, a real mess with it real quick. So keeping it simple until proven otherwise is the way. Uh, so we have values. This one might be like a hex value um, that's assigned to a base token. And then that's assigned to a semantic or component token. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, structure. Um, but it's always strictly this way. So a semantic token always references a base token and never a value. That's really crucial for the layering in the system. So let's have a look at our colors in a bit more depth. So uh, we mentioned multi-brand. So our system uh, will allow our customers to choose a seed color for their primary, secondary, and accent. So from this, uh, and we can see these declared here uh, as pretty straightforward base tokens. Uh, so this one's color, palette, primary, and base, and it's got a value. Uh, and uh, uh, these base tokens are then used to derive um, semantic color ramps. So here you can see we've got a few of these guys, for primary and secondary. Um, the uh, yeah, so we, we derive these color ramps, um, uh, and, and all of this is kind of customizable. So, as I say, the, the, the users will provide a, a base color, uh, and then we will derive uh, the color ramp uh, algorithmically eventually, uh, but by hand at the moment. All of these color ramps use a consistent contrast ratio between foreground and background to help us with accessibility so that the 500 uh, value of the color ramp uh, gives us a double A. Um, uh, when we put the 50 of the ramp over and that's consistent right the way across our colors. So brand colors, these are kind of the, the heart of the, the, the differences we see in uh, the theming at the moment. We also have system colors uh, handling those kind of basic system functions, the usual suspects, info, success, warning, danger. We also include neutral in here. Um, and the system colors for the moment are not something that we're offering for uh, configuration. Uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that warning actually has a huge shift midway through it uh, to try to tackle the dirty yellow problem. Um, and that makes it a little bit more complex to algorithmically define. So we, um, or programmatically define, sorry. So we will um, be looking to extend that at a later date. Uh, we also have our opacity as well. So we define opacity as a scale. And this just allows us to make sure that um, we've got a really clear 
uh, uh, scaling for our opacity and it's all much easier to use and we understand the sort of, I guess, the relative opacity compared to the overall set. Uh, and this is used quite extensively through our color system because we use um, a screen blending for our, or like mix-ins for our, our different states, hovers and, uh, and, and active. So from a color perspective, uh, brand color system colors and opacities really act as our base tokens and everything references back to these three sets. So the semantic tokens. Uh, so we made a decision to go with component concepts as one of our organizing principles for semantic tokens. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing this. Um, I took some inspiration from the uh, now fairly well-known Nathan Curtis article on this and looking at the, Nath at the naming conventions uh, and the idea of a, a concept that groups together um, uh, different, um, uh, different elements within the system, but which had a, a common way of applying tokens, it, it resonated with me. So as you can see on the screen here, we've got some various different ones. We, I thought that this would be much, much, when I started doing this with component tokens, I thought this would get much worse than it actually did. Uh, but as you can see, there are quite a few tokens. Uh, we have box, uh, buttons, inputs, menus, navigation, styled link, tabs, tables, tags, toggles. Uh, we've also got a global uh, item. So most of these um, are pretty straightforward. They're pretty self-explanatory. Semantically, in terms of language, they align with uh, Chakra quite closely as well, which just helps with the overall lined up experience between uh, our electric wrapper and, and the Chakra uh, React components. Um, uh, let's just uh, grab buttons for a minute and just dive into this so I can give you a bit of a closer look. So <clears throat> if we take uh, one of our buttons and our tokens here, we have um, uh, clearly a color. So we start with a category um, or a type. Uh, and then we have the component concept, in this case, button. I then have a semantic usage. So we have things like primary, secondary, accent, info, success, and so forth. Uh, we then have uh, the concept of emphasis. Uh, so this particular one's for solid, but we also have subtle, outline, and ghost. Uh, we then uh, include state, uh, and then we include the, uh, the property that it will be applied to. Quite a lot to take in there, so I'll try to break these down a little bit. Uh, I'm going to work from right to left, actually. So you can see we've got three tokens here, background, foreground, and border. Um, it's quite important, I believe, to clearly define the relationship between these three properties when you're applying them stylistically. Um, we've seen this starting to happen in design systems like M3, uh, the new Material 3. Um, they, uh, they use foreground and background as well. And I think, uh, personally, for me, I prefer explicitly declaring border as well, um, although it adds a, a few more uh, tokens to the set. Um, I think it makes it much clearer uh, in, from an instructional point of view on how to style a component. Um, uh, you know, uh, in terms of states, we've got idle here, but always hover, we have active and we have disabled, um, you different, different components can sometimes have other states we have, uh, in input, for example, we have selected as well, and a few others, um, as I say, the, the, the emphasis solid. So this, the concept of emphasis is a tricky one. It's a slippery beast. This, um, it's really is, it's, it's relative to its intended container, which is a little bit abstract, um. In our particular case, this is a light theme that we're dealing with. We don't have a dark theme at this stage, um, but um, uh, uh, so in this particular case, solid means that it, it appears solid um, relative to a, a light background. Uh, our subtles um, are quite fun. They actually use opacity. So you can see in the token value here, we're referencing a base token for the, uh, the color palette primary 200. Uh, and then we're combining this with an opacity value. So this notation um, uh, in style dictionary allows you to generate um, opacities. Um, and uh, uh, it allows us to basically place these objects, these buttons, uh, and have the background shine through, which is actually quite useful when you have um, like a hover state on a panel behind it, say, for example, in a menu item or something like this. So uh, we do, as I say, end up with a lot of tokens. Um, 
Uh, this is, in fact, a highly over-specified set of buttons. We don't actually use all of these tokens at this stage. Um, but what it does also help us do is start abstracting out the concept of color styles, um, which would allow bulk implementation of these uh, programmatically. But we're not quite there yet. So uh, that's, a, that's a future one. I might show you input as well, just whilst we're here for some contrast. Uh, I've got a few different, you know, and I think you can get like overly strict with yourself around naming and how you group these things. It's really got to be about how you, what, what kind of makes sense? Is it discoverable? Can I repeat discover that? Can I kind of build it into my mental map of what I'm trying to apply these tokens to? Here I've got color input. I've included field and label. Technically field is of course uh, above input in this case uh, around a field controller, which would then contain an input for our purposes, um, but we then have input, we have uh, idle, uh, active, populated, selected, so you can see some of the different states that exist here. Fundamentally, the reason why we have these is because the tokens and how I apply them to the background, foreground, and border for any given um, design choice is going to be different to how I apply those same colors to the different properties in an input field. Uh, and if we keep it really vague and just talk in terms of, you know, a primary idle background and just kept it at that and didn't have any concept of what the component type was, it becomes very abstract as to how you should actually go about applying these. Like, where should I apply this primary um, token? Is it to the, you know, on the background? Like, what, what, when should I do that on an input? Should I do the same thing on a menu? What about navigation? So the the component tokens uh, I feel have become have, have made this much much clearer uh, in terms of how we how we use the system. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to dive into uh, Figma tokens, just bring it up, uh, and just give you uh, a little bit of a uh, walkthrough about how we structured this as well. So. Everything that you see on here, all of these little widgets are actually built out using uh, the Automator plugin, uh, using a script that will talk to Figma tokens and generate them. So it's actually very quick to document them. And to be honest with you, these documents don't, the, the, these items, they don't really matter that much anymore because my documentation really is the JSON file in my uh, Figma tokens. Uh, this is a far more effective way of documenting the design decision because it's transportable. You can use it elsewhere, whereas these objects here aren't that useful. And, um, you know, they're good for referencing and they, they look pretty, um, but that's that's about it. Um, because Figma tokens can also generate and connect to all of the styles, I make all of the decisions that I need to about the design system and its tokens in Figma tokens and then use this to generate the styles and ensure that there's a link between those styles and the tokens in here. And, and honestly, it's, it's, it's life-changing when it comes to managing this. Uh, there is no way that we could have taken on building this number of tokens without the aliasing capabilities of Figma tokens. Um, and whilst it didn't happen overnight, I think we put most of this together probably about three to four weeks with a bit of a long tail at the end as I kept changing values and Nicole kept having to update everything in GitHub. Um, sorry about that, Nicole. Um, but um, uh, it, did, it did drive us towards automating our workflow, so I suppose not a bad thing. Um, so uh, let's just talk through the structures that I've got in here. So I haven't got any themes. Uh, so I've got three different themes. Uh, I've got our main performer one and a couple of test brand ones I've been working through. Uh, so I can just select that guy there. Uh, and in that theme, um, and I'm not going to go into how to build theme too much. That's all pretty well documented in, in the Figma tokens documentation on the website. But um, this particular one, we have a, a, a kind of a folder called shared, uh, semantic colors, typography, core, and icons. These are shared no matter what the brand. Uh, and then I can spin up some, some other brands. Um, so I, I created brand one. And the only difference here is actually the color palette. So you can see just the primary and accent colors. Uh, it's just a single, very oversaturated blue. Um, and, and that's the only difference. Uh, for brand two, I went a little bit further. I'll actually just switch out to that theme. So I went a little bit further. So I actually uh, decided to have a bit of a play just for the purposes of showing you guys some things today. Uh, and I built out uh, a bit of a color variance um, in the palette. Again, just changing primary and accent for demonstration purposes. 
Uh, but we also went and uh, changed a few of the typography um, tokens as well. So I changed the, uh, the, the font family over the heading and body to Roboto from our standard inter. Um, and, uh, and I'll show you those all working later. Uh, and then the same we did with the core as well. So this one contains things like spacing tokens. Uh, and these all use our size tokens as reference. And I bumped up which size value they used uh, for each of the different tokens, which then gets applied in the components. Again, you'll see all of this fun stuff shortly. Uh, cool. So <clears throat> let's have a quick look again, just at the palette and start again. So here you can see, uh, let me just put the labels on. That's reflective of our color ramp. These tokens are all pointing to an actual hex value. You can use HSL, of course. Um, we use hex for now. Um, if we go to now our semantic tokens, let's have a look, say, at our that primary button background that we were looking at earlier. Uh, you can see that it's referencing the token that I just showed you, that primary base token as an alias. We do that with the squiggly brackets around each side. Uh, for now, in our descriptions, we're just replacing uh, the, the raw value, uh, but without the squiggly brackets. Don't put the squiggly brackets in. It does funny things to the transforms, uh, so don't have squiggly brackets in your description, just as a hot tip. Uh, eventually, uh, this may well get used for more instructional um, purposes, um, but at the moment, it's just, uh, it just contains the same alias. Uh, that actually works out quite usefully in your styles. Uh, so if I roll over one of these, uh, is it going to behave? Can we do it? I decided not to hover over anything. Good. I love it when it does that. That's great. Um, wait, here we go. It should work. There we go. So as I hover over that value, it actually then in the description, because that appears in the tooltip, tells me what value that token is actually assigned to as an alias. So this is all just about making sure you can connect the dots mentally um, and you know it's assigned to the right, uh, the right token. Um, it's quite helpful when you're using it. Uh, so these are semantic tokens, as I say, uh, it ref reflective of all of this. It, it, you know, it's a big list. It's why it's on its own. Um, Quite often, I find myself making changes directly in the JSON editor. Uh, and now with the snazziness of, I think, Command S will save it uh, as of the 117, 116 release. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. Um, uh, I don't mind it. If it gets really difficult, I'll copy and paste this out into VS Code, make the changes, copy and paste it back in, save it. Uh, and that works pretty well, too, if you need to get a bit more advanced with your IDE. Uh, let's have a quick word about typography. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. So, um, excuse me, to switch to our typography page. So we try to operate base tokens and semantic tokens in a pretty similar way uh, in, with color. So at a base level, we have our typeset, uh, and that contains our declarations for font family, size, weights, line heights, and all that good stuff that make up our type. Uh, and then we have our textiles, which is really the typography components uh, in uh, Figma tokens. So let's just open one of these guys up. Uh, and you can see in our textiles, they're making you know, references to all of the typeset tokens that we created. Uh, and it works pretty well. Um, these are obviously quite important to do the typography because it's from these styles that you can generate your textiles in Figma. Uh, so if you want your typography driven by um, Figma tokens um, and, and being able to tokenize it, you've got to have your typography tokens in place. Uh, you don't have to um, do the full aliasing. You can put in absolute values, but I would recommend that you don't and avoid that temptation and abstract it. Um, it'll make it easier to scale and change in the future, uh, less disruptive. So yeah, as I say, uh, we've got our various different um, typography tokens. We've got some fairly explicit ones here, uh, component specific around link and button. We just wanted to treat those slightly differently for now. Uh, we've also got a um, type style based around, uh, sorry, a textile based around uh, our icons. So uh, those of you who are familiar with the approach we're taking, we use Font Awesome uh, to drive all of our icons. Um, and it really, the magic really starts here with these typography tokens. Um, so I will show you that actually now. Let's go and dive into that. Okay, tokens for icons. Um, I'm going to do this 
pretty quickly because it's reasonably involved, but hopefully um, we'll give you a bit of a starting point. So I've got to just clarify at the start of this, this relies entirely on using an icon font. Now we use Font Awesome, and this particular example I'm going to show you is completely specific to how Font Awesome implement. So if you've got another kind of uh, 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 font, uh, icon font that you want to use, your approach may differ. Um, if you're using SVGs, this approach won't work for you. Uh, one of the reasons we went for Font Awesome is that recently they've made some pretty big updates. Um, there's now an awful lot of um, uh, uh, icons in their set, I think, at the last count. It, it was a lot, 16,000 or something mad. There we go, 16,150. That's a heck of a lot of icons. Uh, they do them in different styles. So these are essentially represented as weights from a font perspective solid, regular, light, and thin, and we treat them as such. Uh, and as you saw just uh, briefly there, uh, let's have a look at the Alicorn. Um, uh, the way Font Awesome works is uh, from a code perspective, you're, you're passing this value, uh, FA solid, FA, and then the name of the, the icon. And the solid there is representing the weight. So if I chose regular, you can see the class is updating uh, there. Um, so it has this, this kind of string that you pass through and it understands what to do. In many ways, Font Awesome is really acting as a system, in fact, for your icons. Um, and by passing this through, it will return this glyph, which is really awesome. I guess why they call it Font Awesome. Um, so let's have a look at how I've implemented it. So I have icon components. I've got five different sizes of icon components. They're strict size ones that then scale deliberately uh, just to give us a bit more control. Uh, each icon is, uh, just minimize the token for a minute. Uh, each icon is a, um, its own component and inside each component there's variances of each of the different sizes. So uh, these guys are being driven by uh, a, uh, a Figma text style, right? So you can see over here, perform your icon, uh, at small and solid, this one's medium, large, extra large, and 2XL. Uh, so the, the font is doing the heavy lift here, right? If I, um, let's see if I can just grab this guy, drag him over here. If I change that to plus dash circle, you can see font awesome is um, doing its job and it changes the glyph out as you enter that text. But you'll note that that text does not actually include any of that FA solid or, or FA and the name of the token. So the way Font Awesome renders in a tool like Figma or locally on the local install is you just pass it the name. So back on our Alicorn, uh, if I want to put Alicorn in and render that, uh, we can just, let's just do that again. And it's just copying and pasting the word Alicorn in. All right, so with that, base understanding of um, how Font Awesome works. Let's have a look back in our Figma tokens. So as I've mentioned, we use a text style. So if you look at our typography, you can see small solid has been applied here, medium solid and so forth. I can of course apply regulars, as you can see here, I use a regular weight instead for this icon. And so it's, it's just icon specific, uh, how we do it. Uh, so that's stage one. So it's, it's uh, the, the actual component itself is is pretty simple. Um, it's it's a text uh, layer set to hug uh, and then a fixed size wrapper around the outside. Um, I have a tendency to auto layout absolutely everything, so it's an auto layout and it's centered and uh, justify center as well. Uh, inside these components, then are. Uh, is a single text layer, they're all called icon, no matter which icon you look at and which size. And this is also really important for making this work because if those names are different, Figma will not respect uh, any color overrides that you've applied uh, and will reset it back to this base value when you change the icon, which is quite frustrating. So make sure all of those layers are named the same. All right, so with one of these layers selected, as you see, I've, I've got that typography in there. Let's go into the icons themselves. Um, so you won't see anything selected here. Um, I'm just gonna open up this add uh, icon. So in the raw value, you can see this is the, uh, the, the, the FA solid FA plus, whoops, excuse me, um, uh, uh, value for the class name, uh, class details that we want to pass through to um, Nicole and her code. That's what we pass through there. We don't actually use any of that here. Um, we just use the description for creating these icons. So 
I've entered that as plus. And if you remember just from the example I showed you, I just need that name. I don't need any of the rest. And so for this particular icon, or indeed all of these, I can right click on my component, use the documentation tokens and use description to apply it. So if I was to wildly update this, I'll break it because I can't type. <laughs> I love it when I do things like that. There we go. Let's try that again where I can type. There we go. So you can see it, it, it changes basically instantly. Um, this approach has been pretty game changing for us in terms of delivering icons. Like I can just, I created a new icon earlier. I needed a new import icon. Where's it gone? It's just here. And I spun it up. It took me about, I don't know three minutes to put it actually into GitHub and have it as a live component in the system. It's incredibly quick, staggeringly quick. I've never seen anything like it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, in my last design system, I, I would sweat for days over trying to get all the icons done and genuinely annoy my development team with the constant request for, oh, could you update the icon file again, please, and deploy this so that we can then use it in the component. It was, it was pretty painful, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so. Um, this, this approach is working really, really well for us. Um, and again, it's, it's all about handling this stuff at scale. Uh, you know, th this is just the UI icons. We've got some product specific icons as well that are going on. Uh, and, and there's a lot, and icon libraries can get pretty, pretty big. So, so yeah, so this, that was just a kind of a, a I guess a little bit of a, a, a walkthrough of, um, the icons. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm just going to press forward a little bit. As I say, I've written an, icon, uh, an article on the, uh, the icon usage, uh, and Nicole's going to talk a little bit more about actually how we take that stuff and, and implement it later on. Uh, all right, so that's kind of like a bit of a whirlwind tour of, of our theme file. Um, hopefully uh, useful in terms of understanding the structures for names that we use, um, how we generate all of our Figma styles, which are all linked to our Figma tokens um, uh, and, and then managed centrally. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hop over to another file. So this is just a, a little sticker sheet I put together. I, I figured live messing around in our actual production component library was probably an unwise choice. Yep, there we go. As it shows loading, good timing Figma, perfect. Um, so I wanted to use this just to demonstrate a couple of things to you guys. Um, the first is actually applying the tokens in, uh, in a component. Uh, and then the second is the excitement of applying multi-brand. So here are our buttons, pretty straightforward. Uh, also use a plugin called, uh, Popstar, I think it is. Uh, is that the one? Let's have a quick look. It's something like that. No, I'll find it in a minute. Very good for documenting. Uh, it puts all these lovely purple bits in place, uh, which makes it really easy to um, to document these. Does it all automatically? Fabulous. I love it. Uh, right. Let's have a look at our buttons. So buttons are pretty straightforward-ish. Uh, there's a little bit of complexity. These color shifts are actually done using uh, opacities um, off the base. Uh, you don't have to do it that way. Um, if anything, I'm probably just being overly fancy with some of this. Um, but uh, it was working at the time. Um, so let me just zoom in a little bit on good old primary button. Every design system person uses buttons as their demonstration. You know, um, <clears throat> if I now look at that layer and let's pop in button here. There we go, sorry, a little bit of a lag. Um, you can see uh, on our fill layer and our border that the token has been uh, applied. Now, this is kind of interesting because this object that you're seeing here is actually not the actual component. It's an instance of the component in a library that is then pulling in the themes from, let's see, it styles from yet another library. So there's a few things going on here. Both the styles are external to this file and the component itself is external to this file. And yet Figma tokens through the awesomeness and magic of their amazing code is actually keeping track of all of this, which means if I was to change this in my theme file and update the styles, it's all just going to flow through beautifully. Uh, works really, really well. So when you're applying all of these tokens in your components, look, it takes probably, I wouldn't say more effort, but you need to be doing it in conjunction with the component token creation process 
And you want to be pretty strict and disciplined with yourself about applying your tokens everywhere. So be that the gap, the space between, and the padding values around it, uh, the textile, uh, making sure it's semantically correct, making sure that the color for this particular state is using the correct uh, foreground token and the same for the icon as well, making sure the background is et cetera, et cetera, the border radii, the border width. If you have a token and you can use it in Figma, you absolutely should, because this gives you then the scalability to switch out the themes. If you don't take that approach, if you only partially implement, if you want to then multi-theme or you want to make changes centrally and have those cascades through the entire system, um, you will find parts of it do not update and that will be annoying and you'll have to go and do it manually and no one likes doing manual work. So, um, all right, so that's buttons. I can show you a couple of others, I guess. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if I look at this card title, for example, you should see in the typography, heading two is applied. I look at the core tokens here. I've got a 32 um, a pixel. Let's just have a quick look at the size actually for a second. So space is what we use for handling padding and the space between and margins. So it's really about thinking about space as a physical construct. We separate that out and they abstract that out from size. So size really provides us with our um, units of measurement rather than how we're going to apply them. So in some ways, um, size is a, is a base token and space is a, a kind of semantic token. It's not component specific. Maybe it will be in the, in the future, but um, we use this for, for, for our padding and, and space between. Um, we reference the different styles. Uh, again, you don't have to do this. You could hard code it if you wanted. Um, uh, I'm going to use a description there, but um, so this all works pretty well here. Yeah. Uh, so you know, all of the components they're pretty, pretty, pretty similar. Uh, inputs is a is a pretty big one. We've got quite a few different kinds of inputs, but probably no more than most. Uh, we're opinionated with our inputs, so. Personally, when I'm doing components, I try to be a bit more opinionated about them rather than being too abstract. So rather than having input field with left icon as an abstract concept, I just go, it's, it's text or it's password or it's search or it's number. Uh, always thinking about, uh, is it fit for the purpose intended? And is this the easiest designer and developer experience uh, that we can deliver? Uh, this particular component has uh, uh, it's the different types and the different states. And then I've also got a, um, a prop, a component prop for um, switching, whether it's um, populated uh, text or, or hint text. Um, so cool. So look, that was a bit of a whistle uh, stop tour of, of, of these uh, components. Uh, let's show you some magic uh, now because that's enough talking for me and I'm going to let the work do it. Thing so this sometimes takes a hot minute so everybody give it <laughs> bear with me. Um, uh, I live on the Sunshine Coast in Australia and the internet up here is not the best. So um, yeah, all right. I'm going to switch this out to brand two now on the button. So I'm just doing this on the to selection. So all of these components you, you've seen already, you know, they're pointing to this Performio style. You can see over here they're all using the Performio theme. And let's see if we can switch this out to brand two and hopefully by magic and a little bit of patience, we'll start to see, see things transform. The spawning of coral. Um, so some of the changes going on here, quite noticeably the colors, uh, but also the typography. So I, I up the sizes of the typography in all sizes. I up the um, size token of the spacing value for this, this was using, I changed the font um, to use a different font. Uh, and um, yeah, it was real easy to, to do. Like it's, it's not much effort. Sometimes it takes a minute to, to work its magic, but uh, uh, that's, that's the nature of the beast. It's certainly quicker than trying to do this by hand. So you can see here, it's all changing and scaling and being magical. I love seeing this stuff, it's great. Um, Inputs, this is a big one. Let's try this guy. It's not the slowest thing in the world, but it, it takes a while to kind of, a few cycles to go through things. Um, but you can see I've kind of, you know, I've been pretty wild with my colors and color choices here. Um, but I've increased the size and because we use auto layout so extensively and throughout, because we've applied tokens, 
uh, Figma tokens to handle gap and spacing and so forth. You know, this is all just automatically resizing. Um, when you, just as another tip, when you are doing multi-branding, particularly with the Figma side of things more than the code, um, and you do want to have variances in the idea of space between your themes, just make sure you're pretty careful with your uh, use of auto layout, use it extensively and assume that that, component, that, that container that's containing this, this object that you're gonna change size is gonna grow or shrink accordingly. So it's pretty hard to get that perfect alignment in Figma all automatically, um, you know, without various constraint options and min widths and so forth, min heights and max heights. But um, you do want to, if you're gonna be changing spacing tokens in your theme, you probably want to be mindful of that. Uh, last but not least, I thought I might show you a bit of a working page from from uh, like a prototype um, and show you that working across the page. This one does take a, a few seconds, um, but you can see all of my tables will eventually magically resize. All the colored tokens are changing over, the buttons already switched over. Uh, just as another tip, I found, you know, you're asking quite a lot of the system at this point. Um, try not to click around, jump around too much, let it do its thing, um, be gentle. I'm always still amazed that I'm doing this through a Chrome browser in the first place. Not that I normally do that, I use Mac OS, it's faster. Uh, cool, all right, so that is um, a bit of a, uh, an example of how multi-brand theming works. Um, last but not least, I'm just gonna switch back to the themes um, I've got an update to make here. So this is this is how we start our journey uh, of the token. So I've been making some changes in here. I, I tweaked a few things. So uh, this uh, environment uh, is connected to settings. Uh, sorry, it's connected to GitHub in our settings. I flick over to that, uh, but it will show you my license key for Figma tokens. So I'm, I'm not gonna do that, but trust me, it's connected to our GitHub repo. Uh, and in that GitHub repo, uh, we've got a bunch of branches and we've set up just a dedicated branch for token updates. And this just allows me to continuously deploy to this, uh, or sorry, continuously commit to this branch in GitHub. Uh, and uh, so then obviously I can always save these out. Um, and by um, uh, putting it all up into GitHub, it allows me to then use those, uh, all my Figma tokens in my other files as well and keeps them safe and sound and better than as a file on my desktop. Uh, so uh, that's, this is really where the magic starts. Uh, so I would be able to just drop a commit in as usual um, and off we go um, and we put in the commit message. So this is kind of the start of the journey. So <clears throat> that's kind of a, an end to the, the, the whistle stop of the Figma files. Let's have a quick look at how we automate our workflow. So I'll just touch on this very briefly. Uh, we're defining the values assigning those values to the base tokens and then assigning the base token to semantic tokens, create our themes and sets, all the stuff you just saw. So side path of creating our styles, but we commit to our dedicated token branch in GitHub. Uh, and then when we're ready, we'll raise a PR to a feature branch, which is normally where I ask Nicole to take over, which is a convenient moment for Nicole to take over. Sweet. You're going to share your screen? Yep. Cool. So now that Chris has raised the PR of the JSON token changes, there are a couple of steps that take place before we complete the merge. Um, so previously, these steps would be completed manually by a developer where they would first pull the branch locally. They would run our style dictionary transforms if they were all, all good to go then the developer would commit and push the changes. And then finally, they would also run a chromatic build and send these results to Chris to validate. However, now we've automated this complete process so that a developer doesn't have to be involved at all. So we've done that by using GitHub Actions. So now what happens when Chris raises the PR is GitHub Actions will identify that changes have been made to the token, token files. It will automatically kick off our style dictionary transforms and then um, also run a chromatic build where Chris can view the changes. If Chris is all happy with the changes he sees, 
then we can finally merge the PR to the develop branch. Um, however, with, of course, the approval of at least two developers. So now digging how we actually complete the transforms of our tokens into CSS. So we use a tool called Style Dictionary, which takes our JSON files, runs some transforms, and then outputs our theme file. On the example on the right, which is our uh, config file for Style Dictionary, you can see that we actually have our own custom formatter. Uh, the reason we, why we do this is because Chakra have their own object structure for their theme that we need to replicate. Taking a, a token of size medium, or MD, sorry, uh, as an example, you can see how the token key and value have transformed from a JSON structure to a theme object structure. From the output, you can see that some changes have been made. First of all, the, the token category has changed from size to sizes, and that's to match Chakra's theme key, which is sizes. Secondary, um, the value has changed from 20 to 20 pixels. So this is to make it valid CSS. And finally, we've also uh, generated a TypeScript type for the token created, which is MD. These ch changes um, happen as part of our own custom formatters. So our custom formatters do a few things. They first resolve the theme path. It also resolves the, the value from the token. Um, as part of this step, we also run any conversions that need to be done. So for the case of sizing, um, every token with the type of size will run through a convert size token um, function, which, as you saw before, applies pixel to the end of uh, the token value. It will then construct the theme object um, from the resolved path and values. And finally, we also generate TypeScript types for each of our tokens that we create. I uh, would also like to walk you through some of the cool things that we're doing with our, um, our icons. So our icons do pass through the same formatters um, as our other icons do. However, we have added an additional formatter um, that will, uh, sorry, that will, um, that will generate a file that imports our icons from the token set and then add them to our font awesome library, saving us having to do this manually. So going back to the automation piece, uh, we no longer, once Chris adds or updates icons, make any changes manually, it handles it itself, which obviously uh, removes any chances of us making mistakes or forgetting to add an icon to the library. Our limitation with Chakra is that they don't actually have theme keys for some of our icon categories, for example, opacity and icons. So to over overcome this limitation, we have created helper functions to retrieve a token value from a type token name and theme object. So in the example below, you can see that we are retrieving a icon token value from the icon theme object and the type icon name. Finally, just some helpful hints for the developers. We do use our own um, custom formatters. However, we strongly suggest using the style dictionary um, inbuilt formatters if possible, um, and only use custom when absolutely necessary. If you do have to use custom formatters, we suggest using dictionary.all tokens over dictionary.tokens. The reason for this is because dictionary.all tokens returns the tokens in a flattened array structure versus tokens, which uh, returns the tokens in a nested object structure, just making the tokens easier to, to deal with and um, working on them. We also recommend that if you are using TypeScript to generate strongly typed token keys, this is helpful for, um, for ensuring that people don't use the wrong, type, um, the wrong tokens and also, it's, it's nice to have a bit of IntelliSense back when writing the code. We also use Storybook to print all of our tokens as well as of our components. 
Uh, so you can see an example on the right-hand side for um, some documentation on our icon, component, um, icon tokens. So in that documentation, we explain how to use the tokens and we also list all of the tokens available. We find that this is a really good resource for the developers to quickly figure out what kind of tokens they need and how to use them. It's also not just helpful for that, but it's also helpful for regression testing. So again, we use Chromatic for regression testing. So what happens if say um, we have our current build, but then Chris um, will submit uh, a new icon. Chromatic will show you the difference between the past build and the, um, the brand new build. And from there, you can actually see that an, it will highlight that a new icon has been created, which is very, very useful, not just for the tokens, but also for our components as well. Cool. Thanks for listening in. Wow, guys. <clears throat> That was an amazing presentation. I would say it's almost a masterclass. I think this is of a lot of value for, for so many teams. So thank you so much. Um, I see we have only five minutes left based on the original schedule, but um, I think we can uh, go on a little longer and go through some of the questions that are there. Um, also, everyone, there is a link uh, to a Slack channel on our Slack community. Uh, in the webinar emails. So uh, if you have any questions that are not answered or you would like to catch up with Chris and Nicole or the people on our team after the live stream, uh, yeah, please join that channel. <clears throat> uh, and I think now we'll quickly move on to the questions that were there uh, for Chris and Nicole. Yes, I will go through them uh, uh, via the upvotes. So uh, let's start with the first one. So one question over here uh, by how do you deprecate old tokens? What happens in the design files uh, that reference old tokens? How do you manage coexistence of deprecated tokens and with the current tokens in a system? So I think I'm going to pass this on to Chris. Actually, starting off with the, the, the curly ones, right? Just straight in there. <laughs> um, uh, look, the, the long and short of it is that we don't really have a situation of old tokens right now, to be completely frank with you, based on where we are in our development. We're very early on in that. Um, uh, we haven't really run into it too much. Well, what we tend to run into more than anything is when uh, I, I go, oh, this whole approach isn't going to work. I'm going to need to remap these to a new token set. And we've already got our component tokens assigned in the code. So we have a, a wrapper that's got our component tokens that's passing through to the chakra props. Um, so obviously, if I'm changing the token that's assigned to the component itself, that's going to require an update. And that just requires some pretty close coordination between the designers and the developers. Um, we're a pretty small team working on this right now, although international, we've got teams over in India as well. And, and, uh, and elsewhere. So um, we just work in very close coordination with a high degree of communication. Um, I'd like to say it's robust. We're not at that stage yet. Um, probably less process in the early days is, is quite beneficial. So the focus has really been around creating a very flexible concept for the semantics to be described and uh, that gives us quite a lot of flexibility. You know, we can rename them quite easily. We can um, move things around quite easily. Whilst there's some coordination, the change itself is not difficult. Um, and of course, we can create new semantic tokens as we discover new uh, components that we wish to include in the system. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, then the next question. <clears throat> Ah, question from Sylvia. Oh. Nice to see you here, Sylvia. Very pro setup. How do you onboard and teach other designers to use or create tokens and components themselves? Do you document how to set up something like this? Great question, Chris. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> again, just at the stage of development that we're at, um, there's a lot of knowledge within the team and within our heads. Uh, we are trying to get that out. It is a bit of a struggle to document and create simultaneously. Um, we're often actually creating these components and doing them in the context of actual 
um, initiatives that are going on within the organization rather than dedicated work on the design system. So as is pretty classic of most product companies, there's a, uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, pressures and things going on at the same time, and you've got to kind of work smart with how you do that. So uh, in terms of teaching uh, other designers, funnily enough, the, the last designer on our team uh, that I taught last week, I think it was, is actually on this uh, this chat now. Uh, hello, Christina. Um, and uh, look, I, I do a lot of manual walkthrough um, with the design team. There's, there's a level of orientation. This, this is all very new for all of us at the moment. So uh, there's a lot of just very close collaboration. Um, we chat a lot. Um, we brainstorm a lot. Um, I like to do review sessions with everyone and get them involved in the components. And so doing so helps with orientation around how the components work and getting orientated around the tokens. Um, at the moment, for the most part, the use of Figma tokens for the team is kept pretty much to me. Um, the team is using the styles that we have set up, but obviously because it's magical and amazing, that, that's actually quite useful because it's not hard for us to then retrospectively apply tokens um, to those components as we kind of harden them and make them ready for the UI kit. So, um, so yeah, so, so there's that side, uh, Nicole briefly mentioned, I think the, the storybook, uh, side of things and, and how that's basically printed out, uh, which is also awesome because it's always kept up to date, uh, because of use of chromatic and it's tying into the branch as well. So it's, it's really easy to actually digest what components we have and all the props that are available and all of the different token options and colors and so on. Um, a great deal of this is about familiarity and discoverability. I think um, most designers and developers who've kind of you know been around a little bit will not find it that hard to to get into. Um, using components in Figma can be challenging always uh, as you try to replicate what we want to do in code but can't, uh, and um, that can be that can be pretty challenging. Um, so it, it is really about making sure that. Uh, people are supported ideally on a, like a one-on-one -on -one level as much as possible and then in group sessions all right thanks then the next question is from jeroen zwarteporte do you support a <laughs> light or dark color scheme in your system and if so how yeah i think you already <laughs> answered that right there's no dark mode yeah right that the answer is n no, but in my heart of hearts, the multi-branding was really so that I could have a dark theme in my application. Cause yeah, yeah it's very I'm a dark similar. theme kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I would, I would love to be able to do that. that the, from a technical perspective, there's actually nothing stopping us. It's just another theme. Uh, all I actually have to work through with the team is uh, probably a desaturated color palette. Um, so uh, that's it's more of a sh sequencing thing than anything else. Um, uh, getting the color palette right for dark mode is quite crucial. Um, you got you can't just use the same one that you've used on light mode. Uh, the other thing that we would need to just kick the tires on is the concept of emphasis to ensure that that uh, we 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 can deal with that, which we haven't really tested out yet. There's actually someone hand gliding down the mountain behind you, Mike, right now. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Lots of paragliders over here. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, so uh, we we don't we don't do like, uh, dark mode yet, but I hope that we will in the future. Uh, and the approach you saw today uh, should work just fine for dark mode if you just define your values. Yeah, like you said, I think it's it's pretty much just a different theme. <clears throat> so uh, yeah. yeah, you're almost there. Yeah. All right. All right. Next question. Next one from Sylvia again. How long did it take you to set this up and how did you convince stakeholders to get the budget for it? Thanks, great session. Yeah, that it was for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you very much, very kind. Um, how long did it take us to set up? Uh, look, end to end, and bearing in mind, we, we were working on a bunch of stuff in parallel to this. So like the total duration was about three months, but the total amount of effort could be measured in weeks, I think, in terms of what we applied to it. I probably did a bit more because I actually rebuilt the semantic token structure during the course of that because I decided that my old approach wasn't working, as I mentioned before, and switched into this component semantic concept. Um, so that required a little bit of rejigging on my side, but yeah, it... You know, I, I to be fair, like this isn't my first design system. I'm pretty familiar with tokens. I'm pretty familiar with the concepts behind them, building components in this way, 
in Figma, like I have done this before. So I'm already at a, a probably an advantage to someone coming into this fresh. Um, uh, I guess my, my advice there is keep it as simple as possible until you need it to be complex. Uh, in terms of convincing stakeholders, I am extremely fortunate to have a wonderful line manager and friend who um, give me lots of support and help um, with with this. Um, I'm a on the tools kind of guy, uh, and and she helps me enormously with that. Um, but our, when I arrived, um, the team was already pretty clear that there was an absolute need for a design system. Um, uh, we know that we needed to do. Um, uh, uh, a lot of work on our user experience, and we knew that the best way that we could do this, the most structured and 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 hopefully that the way that's going to last us the longest, right? You know, front end experiences are a bit more volatile than the back end side of things. You know, they come and they go, they change with taste, different features, different teams, they all evolve over time. So we needed something that was really flexible there. So the, I was very fortunate, I think, with this, insofar as we're a very technical team. Uh, on protecting even not just on the product side, but actually our product is, is quite technical. Uh, and so we've got a lot of people who understand scalability. We've got a lot of people who understand um, that need for abstraction uh, and the need to invest in really uh, highly scalable, very flexible tooling to enable the teams to deliver the best work. So we are in a pretty fortunate position. It's a pretty good crew and, you know, everyone, everyone kind of gets the idea. So. Uh, from a budget perspective, um, we're a product team. We're a fixed-sized product team, so we're, we're done on headcounts. So we don't have to go asking for budget uh, on that. It's more about prioritizing the work, which is why we work on the design system uh, as a, a, a you know an emergent uh, outcome of the uh, project and slash initiative work that we do on the product uh, through our OKR cycle. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then the next question is from Lucas. So all styles are in one library here. So how would you do this if your brand one and brand two each have their own published libraries and styles? How would you link token styles to external libraries? Good question. A lot of upvotes here. Mm, mm. I haven't actually done it yet. So, um, and you know what? It's an interesting thing. Like I think that there's, there's maybe an argument to say that you might want your brands in their own styles. I think the thing to remember is with that theme file, like I'm literally really using it only to store styles in. The, the documentation around the outside is, is, is representative. It doesn't really worry me too much. So um, ha having it all in the one place can be advantageous, obviously, to be able to use the, the theme switching. Uh, Mike, Robert, maybe this one for you. It, it, I yeah. don't know if you, you run into this, uh, whether you can... <laughs> You have a theme in one library, styles over that library, and then yeah, let me take that. Library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, with the uh, non-local styles that we have right now, right, which is recently released out of beta <clears throat> into production, uh, you actually have a very sophisticated way of of doing this. So you can not just have one theme in one published library. Uh, right now, you would actually be able to even take certain subsets of your styles and publish those in separate libraries and have them linked to a theme. Uh, so you could have one uh, one published library per brand. You could have one published library per brand in light mode and in dark mode separately, or you could even break it up more granularly. Uh, at the same time, the plugin also allows you to uh, create a, a single library file where you, uh, you know, publish all these themes in one go or all the styles in one go separate from your component libraries. Uh, it also allows you to actually prefix all the styles with the theme name. I think that's what uh, Chris was showing as well. Like the theme is right there in front of the style name. So if you're publishing it from a single library, that is definitely uh, comes in really handy. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think we are yet to uh, publish a small video on the latest update of non-local styles because it's pretty uh, pretty advanced. Uh, so yeah, this is all possible. You can you can go either way, and it's really a matter of preference. It doesn't really matter for us. Uh, essentially, what we do is we associate style IDs from a style to a particular token in a particular theme. So that's how it works, uh, and you then be able to apply those from whatever library. So uh, yeah, I think. I think that answer should answer the question. All right. Over to the <laughs> next question from James. Does the design team use Figma tokens plugin in their workflow, for example, to switch brands? 
not yet, but that is the intent. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping for a Figma widget with a quick, uh, a quick change. But <laughs> on the way, you know. Yeah, on the way. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, that will be that. That would be ideal. I think. Like, you've got to always think of these design experiences. You know, the designers need to be focused on solving the customer and business problems. The tools should be pushed to the side whenever possible. Because right. if you've got, you can, so then you're focused, right? The tools need to get out of the way and enable you to do that work. If we're bombarding people with a million different options the whole time, I think it can get a, a bit overwhelming. Um, and a, especially for sort of, new, you know, people coming into their design career as well. Like we, we want them to stick around. Not um, So um, uh, I think uh, ideally a, a simple theme switcher is a, is a pretty good place to be going. Um, and yeah. I personally prefer the idea of keeping, for, for us anyway, using Figma tokens for when you're building a component in the actual design system library. Um, but at the same time, um, if somebody's comfortable using Figma tokens when they're prototyping and concepting things outside of the library, I, and they want to use the same token structure, I'm very happy with that because if they're leveraging the design decisions that we hold central in our tokens, uh, that's even if they design something completely different, at least they're doing so within some kind of familiar structure and familiar decision uh, uh, boundary, uh, which should really be the ideal situation, right? They should have the freedom to solve the problems that they need to in that context uh, and then, you know, build uh, from there. I kind of think of these things like gracefully failing over. It's kind of like that contribution model thing. Um, can I solve this problem using what I've got already today? And if I can't, what, what do I need to change? But what can I also hold steady? And the last thing you take away is the tokens. Uh, the tokens should really be essentially, you know, the, 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 there is nothing lower lower down. It's the, the quantum foam, if you will, of the design system. There is nothing left um, at, at the end of it. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that one. Uh, next question from Brett. In the component tokens, why do you reference color before button instead of the other way around? So I think this is about the naming convention over here. Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, personal choice. Um, part of it's just down to uh, helping me organize a little bit. Uh, I um, I think about the color first or the, prop, the, the, the kind of top level category. I like to categorize my tokens so I can then know what I should expect from there. I think it's also quite useful for when you're using these and you're kind of, you know, typing it out. Um, if, if, you know, you're not going to be applying a typographic token to a fill uh, or, or anything like that. And if you think about it in the code perspective, if you were type scripting this, you know, you again, you're not, you want to keep those token types quite separate. They're different concepts. They deal with different things. Can you do it the other way around? Absolutely, you could. I mean, you could go instead button, color, and all of those. You could then have like button text uh, and, and all of that. You could have button icons. If there were specific icons for your buttons, you absolutely could do it that way around. There is, this is, I think, one of the things about the, the, the token naming is you've got to decide on what works for you. You want to be looking for commonality of the relationship um, uh, uh, kind of between the same types of tokens and then the clear difference across other types of tokens so that you don't get confused um, and be as explicit as you can you know figma tokens what it lets you do is it makes you it lets you make tokens cheaply in the old days you had to do this by hand and it's expensive to make them right it takes time but because you can handle these things at scale and you can make them cheaply i say make more tokens that are more explicit so that it's ultimately clearer for those people who have to use it and yeah, you could have probably abstracted it out into some very clever abstraction, but does anyone understand how to use it? Uh, and I think that's the thing we've always got to keep in mind is the balance between the, the logical and the almost information architectural decisions you're making, but then also the designer's experience in Figma and the developer's experience in the code. And that human experience and the limitations and differences between Figma and code sometimes cause us to make decisions in a certain way. Is it right? Is it wrong? Time will tell. Um, what works for you is the best way, always. Yeah, I think it's, it's largely a matter of preference, like you say, mm -hmm. what works for the team. All, All right. right. I think you'll take one or two more questions. And yeah, this is the last. Up. <clears throat> so one reminder, if you had any other questions that are not answered right here, uh, follow them up in the behind the system Slack channel after the event. 
I think Chris and Nicole will be happy to answer more questions over there. All right, next question from Charles. <clears throat> With the textile being used for fonts, how do you handle unique icons that are not handled by the font? Yeah, that's an interesting one. What if the 16,000 icons are not enough? So with Font Awesome, you can actually submit icons to use. So we have a, a paid account with them. Uh, so we could uh, specify a custom icon and submit it for use. Um, so that's one way. We haven't run into that problem uh, as yet. Look, Font Awesome is an amazingly quick way of bootstrapping your icons. Um, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, it's designed pretty heavily for a 16 uh, point grid and when you get off that grid uh, at different sizes like you put in 13 point the icons can sometimes look pretty funky um, and obviously on non-retina displays they're going to look a bit pixelated as well uh, these are the the compromises that you make the, the, this is why figment this is why tokens are about design decisions this yes there's a design part but also remember it's a decision that you're making and you're documenting that decision why I liked using Font Awesome was my ability to uh, massively improve our workflow through these very formative times so that we could focus on the really important parts. But whilst also, um, you know, having a pretty reasonable icon set. Is it perfect? No. But we, we're managing. And we've got some very abstract concepts in our product. So uh, 16,000 icons is still quite a few. Uh, but if you've got your own custom brand ones and things like this, um, you know, uh, it would be worth having a look to see whether you could get that into Font Awesome if that was an option, or whether you can explore creating your own uh, icon font uh, that serves your need, and maybe there's a way to tokenize this. Um, you just by passing the values in. Um, I'd imagine you'd need a local uh, true type or something installed on your, your computer as well to reference it within Figma. Um, but if you're able to follow a similar pattern, uh, if, in fact, you could improve on it and be able to use the same value and not have to use the description field, in fact, to populate the glyph in Figma, that would actually be even better. Um, um, but, uh, yeah. All right. So we do. Short. All right. The, the last question. And it's time for the last question. The question from Grant. <clears throat> do the seed colors fall into their associated color ramp? Mm -hmm. mm, no. Uh, our green, it's, so the colors you saw in there for Performio, um, like we're, we're, we're building out a new experience in line with our current experience. So we do have certain constraints that we have to make so that the thing doesn't feel like two totally separate applications as we do it. Uh, one of those is a, a legacy brand color that we have. Uh, that green very excitingly fails AA testing on both black and white. So that's awesome when you're trying to build an accessible color palette. Uh, so I actually use uh, the Leonardo Color IO. Uh, I actually don't use that website. There's a plugin called Accessible Color Palettes. Uh, I think that's the one. Uh, and that, what that lets you do is set a foreground color and a background color, and then you can apply contrast ratios. Uh, and then I use those same contrast ratios throughout consistently, um, which gives me my, my shades. Uh, I will probably end up writing a little bit of an article on this one as well. Uh, it's not a Figma tokens thing, but in the interest of uh, we do actually, we are tokenizing or have tokenized the contrast ratio. Uh, and eventually, um, I hope that we'll be able to automate all of this and, and show you the full thing. But uh, that's some time away yet. <clears throat> all but right. The colors do not yeah, oh, sorry. fall into that. No, no, you're I'm done. All right. Yeah, Chris, Nicole, this was like a fantastic session. There was so much value packed in this, both in, in the presentation as well as in the answers from the Q&A. Thank you, everyone, for joining the first edition of Behind the System. Uh, we will stream another one somewhere towards the end of uh, next month, so keep an eye out on our channels. And like I said, we have a dedicated Slack channel uh, if you want to discuss more on this subject uh, or get in touch with Nicole and Chris. They're all there. The Figma Tokens team is there as well, including Robert and myself. So once again, thank you, everybody, and looking forward to the next one. Bye-bye. Cool. Thanks.